Okay, good afternoon. Uh, Brian and Monica here at the University Museum at the University of Pennsylvania. It's uh, the Museum of Anthropology and Archaeology, which lends itself nicely to what we wanted to talk about today. It is the Great Lyre, which is an, an ancient harp, uh, is reconstructed out of wood and precious materials. Where is it from? Uh, it was excavated in Ur, and it was a combination excavation between the British Museum and London, University of Pennsylvania and the National Museum in Baghdad. Well, it, it, this piece seems to challenge students' expectations because it doesn't quite conform to what they would expect to see in an art museum. If, if we told them to go see a work of sculpture, they would expect, I don't know, sculpture, right? right. Uh, something made of stone or something carved in wood. Um, but they would recognize the precious material, right? So we see the bull's head clearly made of gold. And I would think if they saw gold in a museum, in an ancient museum, they would immediately think of Egypt. But this is a much different scenario, right? Right. This is from about the same time as artifacts we're used to seeing from ancient Egypt, but a different geographical area in uh, modern day. About 2600 BCE, they say? Yes, that's right. So in the time of the Old Kingdom in Egypt, they're already very experienced in working with gold, making castings and such. Uh, and here, it seems like we have a different kind of material, right? Yes, that's right. It's um, gold leaf that's been hammered uh, very thinly and laid over a core of wood and attached to the wood with um, uh, bitumen, which is a kind of uh, coal pitch. Huh. There are other precious materials here as well, right? The, the beard and the uh, hair and the tips of the horns of the bull are made of lapis lazuli, which Great. is a very precious stone. It would, would have had to be imported um, from Afghanistan to to Ur. Um, you know, I'm glad you brought that up about the lapis lazuli because the first thing you notice is that it's not only a gold bull, but it has a blue beard all right, and blue tips on its horns. So the first suggestion maybe to a student coming to this object that it's not meant to be some kind of an ordinary bull. It's certainly right. not a naturalistic bull. While it may look immediately recognizable like a bull, it's certainly representing something else. So it almost begs for interpretation. That's right. right. Yes. And uh, the way that the hair and the beard it has perfectly regular rows and um, is, uh, stylized. stylized yeah, in yeah. that way. Exactly. So, right. So we've got the bull's head uh, over a wood core, is it? Or That's simple? right, wood core. So mm -hmm. very thin gold. So suggesting, yes. like you said, it would have to be imported. Um, yeah, so I mean, even, even in ancient times, gold was very precious. So um, you wouldn't want to have it made of solid gold. To give the appearance of solid gold, you right. can make a core and then have very thinly hammered gold attached to that core. The, 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 the other main panel down below is an inlay panel made of, I think, shell. Is that right? That's right, shell in the background of that same kind of um, coal pitch called bitumen. Right, and there we see, uh, really, quite wonderfully, four registers. So this is going to be immediately recognizable to students of Mesopotamian art to see the way that it's created in a series of easily digestible zones or regions. Right, that's right. right. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, though, is that the animals in each of the four registers, including some human figures that we'll talk about in a minute, are all uh, startlingly naturalistic. They really are. You can see the curve of the bodies, even some of the bone structure and muscle structure underneath. But they're not doing things that you would expect animals to do, are they? <laughs> right. The, uh, the second register from the bottom, we have two animals performing music. One seems to be dancing. So what's so interesting about that second register is we see the bull lyre itself. Oh yeah, because um, how how was this, how was this found? We know that uh, when they excavated the tomb, they didn't have the whole lyre at all, right? They just had the, the the head of the bull and the panel in front. Right. According to what Wolsey tells us, is uh, only the precious material survived. The wood would have certainly. Uh, disintegrate. Yes, over the thousands of years. Certainly. So what we're told is that they're using this inlaid panel to actually reconstruct, reconstruct the lyre itself. Right, because we can see there the strings of the lyre, we can see the, the bull's head itself. Um, and so what we see here in the museum has been built up around the picture that you see in that second register. Wow, and you can really imagine with the, with the new wood, you can imagine the resonance of this piece of wood, right? The strings look like nylon and they're turned over the top so it looks like they're tuned right. from the top of the instrument. Right. Boy, you, you, you almost really want to hear it. Yes, you right? do. You, you right. want to hear that, that resonance. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I'm sorry, so moving up the, the panels, the third register from the bottom is what you were referring to as animals not quite behaving like animals. Mm -hmm. Right, we see a, a lion or some kind of feral cat carrying um, what looks like ceremonial vessels. Uh, yeah, the lion with this kind of jug, jug of wine and a cup in his, in his right front paw. 
boy, uh, wine and ceremonial procession right, that suggests makes, funeral, right? Definitely, yes. And in fact, look at the, uh, that's a hyena there in front of him. He's acting as a, as a butcher. You can see that knife uh, tucked into his, ah, okay. into his waistband. He's got that crate in front with animal parts in it. So right. he's preparing, having slaughtered animals for so, feast. so not not uncommon the type of rituals we would associate with a tomb that's right this right. is found in a tomb so we see things associated with uh with with death and and funeral feasting happening now, there full disclosure here we, we've jumped in very boldly into the two middle registers and we've uh, left aside the complicated registers on either end the lowest right. one has a uh, goat again standing on its hind legs mm -hmm. with ceremonial vessels that's right but then this man who is described usually as the scorpion man that's right, right. he's got the, that that also stylized body but clearly with those kind of um, the segmented those segmented portions of his body that look like a scorpion. Interesting too that as the only human figure that we've talked about so far, he's the only figure that is approximated a kind of a twisted profile, right? That's his right. feet are going in the same direction mm -hmm. very profoundly as are the shoulders, but the chest is turned forward. That's right. And we don't see any other of the animals kind of forced into that conventional That's posture. That's right, yeah, that, I, I, it, it, it seems that the human figure is force into that. The animals don't have to be represented that way. And, and I've read in almost every textbook that there's no definitive interpretation of the Scorpion Man. That's right. Some people like to interpret him as a character from the Epic of Gilgamesh, which was a um, great work of uh, One of the major Sumerian sources of, of, of imagery and narrative right, right from that period. Right. But it's not a uh, not definitive interpretation. Well, it's interesting. To see the upper panel, you have to walk to either side. That's right. right? Because the beard, I don't know if this is the way that they've interpreted the reconstruction or of the way it seems on the bull lyre itself. Uh, but you have to kind of walk around to see that other one. And here we see our second human figure, right? Right. And he's also standing in twisted profile or some variation of it, right? The feet That's clearly right. going mm -hmm. in the same direction as mm -hmm. the head. But his chest is shown frontally. Great. And on either side, a pair of heraldic animals. They look like they're, uh, again, part of some kind of ceremonial moment that we can't quite explain. Right. They've got the bodies of bulls and the horns of bulls, but yet their their faces look quite human. Ah, quite. So I think, don't you think this is one of the great things about seeing um, a work of archaeology or art in a museum, uh, whenever this is rep reproduced in a textbook, you can see that panel perfectly yes, clearly. It's yes. not obscured by the beard of the bull at all. Um, but here we can get, if this is truly the way in which it was made, you get a better sense of how it would have appeared. Yeah, so one might, as a student might have trouble kind of recon reconstructing this in their mind um, of how it might appear in its physical sense. So here in the museum, you get the physical object, which I have to say is displayed um, about four feet off the ground. Mm -hmm. So we're really getting a sense of it kind of on a pedestal, whereas yes. in a museum of art and archaeology and anthropology, you can imagine in the tomb, this would simply be another decorative object. Right. right? So you can imagine thrones and the kinds yeah, of what, things. Yeah, what other kinds of things were found in this tomb? Gold work that would be headdress for the queen, um, all kinds of objects that would be associated with the royal presence. So this would simply be another kind of uh, standard bearer for the royal presence of the queen. It makes one wonder if it was actually ever used at all as a liar, if it was a ceremonial all along. Good point, good point. So we encourage students to experience these objects in their space. And as Monica says, a, a very different um, presentation of the object than you would get from photography. Right. So hopefully students can come and find it here in the University of Pennsylvania. I will say it has been largely on tour over the last 10 years. That's right. Ten, ten, Ten cities in ten years for these objects, which have become very popular, especially in the wake of the Second Gulf War, as some of the most uh, rare objects from ancient uh, Iraq. Right.